Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. Alina, predictably, is bouncing off the walls today because one of her favourite people has come to join us. Alina, who's here? So we have with us Tim Reynolds, who's a senior lecturer in archaeology at Birkbeck University of London. And of course, he is a former lecturer of mine. He taught me all I need to know and exactly how to be an archaeologist. So sorry if I mess up, it's all Tim's fault. Um, he's got way too many publications to list, so we're going to skip that. And he specialises in Neanderthals and the modern human, which is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. It's exciting. Hi, Tim. Hello. Hi there. Right. OK. Alina, you know Tim well. What's this about a Mary Beard exam question? So I did my my first my first uh, course was with Tim and he taught his methods and practice in archaeology. And it's not easy. I'm just warning you guys. It's not easy. And um, the night before the exam, I went and watched Mary Beard's Pompeii uh, thing on TV. And I managed to answer like half the questions in the exam. Sorry, Tim. Um, on this <laughs> one episode. And I actually got a really good mark. So I'm quite excited. Sorry, Tim. Now you know my dirty little secret. <laughs> it yeah. just proves that Mary's awesome. She is indeed. Yeah. But make us all redundant. We've got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. She works very, very hard. Um, so Matt Pope came on a couple of weeks ago and talked all about Neanderthals and now you're here to talk to us about um, modern humans from the prehistoric era. Can you just briefly tell our listeners why they're different things? Right, well, they're completely different species okay. uh, currently as, as, as we define things, although that, <laughs> that may change. Uh, in, in the old days when we, we were growing up, if two individuals could interbreed and produce viable offspring, they were the same species. Uh, fossil species that's different, particularly when they're closely related. So Neanderthals are a different species at the moment, but it seems that because we picked up Neanderthal genes, we can actually interbreed with them. So we need to be thinking, I mean, there is a debate going on about what now constitutes a uh, species. So, so is this like when, so when we talk about early humans, just so our listeners understand, it's like when you're looking at apes and you can say, well, they're all apes, but that's a chimpanzee and that's a different ape. And so it's kind of like that, isn't it? So they're all humans, but they're all distinct species from each other. Yeah, that's, um, that's the thing. When, when you're looking at species that are so closely linked, then you always get these issues. Of where do you actually end up drawing the line? Um, some, with all the work on DNA now, some people have even argued that in fact we're so little different that we should actually have, include chimps as, as part of our own, own lineage, that we are, you know, if you like, uh, just a variation on a chimp theme, which I don't agree with, I have to say. I like to say I'm, I'm a bit like a monkey sometimes. I don't know about you, Alex. <laughs> You're like a monkey all the time. I jump off the walls, like you said earlier, that is what I do. Whatever. Monkeys are cool. <laughs> I love them. I went and hung out with gorillas in December in Rwanda and Uganda and they were epic. That kind of sounds exciting. I've got to go and do that. It was brilliant. It just like even they're so like us. It was just brutal. It was just like the little hands. Were exactly there you the same go, as Tim. Ours. Tim, your whole research has just been debunked by Alex because she said <laughs> that they're just like us. Sorry. Alex, stop with these gorillas. Let's go back to modern humans, right? So, Tim, when did the first modern humans appear on the map? Right. Well, recently we've discovered that we are almost twice as old as we thought. Um, the oldest now we have for modern humans is about 330,000 years ago, a site called Jebel Ehud up in Morocco in North Africa. Do you know, I was reading about that and I can't believe that we can pinpoint something so unique. Well, that's because they actually, they've actually got the fossils from that particular cave. I mean, so given that they're there 330,000 years ago, you, there should be just like a tail going further back, 360, you know, maybe even 400, to when the, you know, the species actually comes into being. So what we have is we have dated sites and particular places, but you know, the, the picture is always going to be much more fuzzy than that. You know, we're dealing with sort of evolutionary and geological time. It's so when I say 330,000 years ago, you know, Saturday afternoon, three o'clock, it's not that sort of detail. We, we don't have that kind of detail. But what that did do is add, basically, we thought before that, we only dated back 180,000 years. So it, a huge lump of time. And it begs the question, well, well where are the other guys? Where, where are the rest of the modern humans <laughs> between 180,000 and 330,000? You know, we just haven't found them yet. For that reason, there's massive debate, isn't there, about um, where 
early modern humans come from and what kind of evidence is there? Well there's three different sorts of evidence really. The, the, the best evidence at the moment is basically the, the fossil record itself uh, and when you get back as far as you know 330,000 they're like us but they're still different. They're enough like us to be classified with us and they're different enough from other things to be not with us but you know, that, that's what we've got the skulls are as close as, as, as much as we can get to being us. The other evidence is DNA, but DNA doesn't preserve very well. In, in the, the key place we really need to be chewing in, into the DNA evidence, of course, is, is in Africa. And, you know, so we need more DNA from Africa to identify what fossils should be placed where. And then the third sort of evidence is probably the worst sort of evidence, really, which is the archaeology. I hate to say this as an archaeologist. But archaeologists tend to think that different species make different tools. And therefore, if you find one sort of tool, that must mean, uh, you know, that's the species you get with it. So hand axes, we used to think were Homo erectus. Whereas in fact, now we know that modern humans, Neanderthals, all sorts of creatures made hand axes. So the archaeology is the weakest evidence. The DNA is the hardest to pin down. So fossils are our main evidence. Was there average lifespan like us i mean what do we live till most of us who are 80 90 years old if i'm not mistaken someone's going to correct me that i'm completely if wrong but... <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be less than that isn't that that far back without medicine and, and it's, personal it's hard care. to say because you know for individuals to end up in the fossil record they are by them by, by the just the nature of the evidence they're they're unusual because you know most most bodies just rot away and, and never get fossilized Given what we have, though, I mean, 40 plus is certainly, you know, a, a, lot, of in, a lot of fossils and, and things we have seem to be getting on to that sort of age, 40,000. Uh, sorry, 40 years, I think that would be old, 40,000. Yeah. <laughs> 40, 40 plus. That's, that's getting into Mary Berry territory. Though. <laughs> I'm sure she uh -oh. thing, right? oh, I love her. I love her. <laughs> yeah, so... But the, I mean, the biggest risk, you know, a lot of child mortality, a lot of infant mortality, uh, uh, women dying in childbirth and lots of accidents. And of course, infectious disease, you know, before antibiotics, even modern humans die very rapidly of, of all sorts of things we take for granted now is, is not important. But if you've made it to sort of 40, the odds are making it to 50 was quite possible and maybe 60 and beyond as well. So on average, we can say, yeah, the lifespan sort of 40 to 40 to 50, 40 to 60, but it depends on, the, on your individual life history as to where you, you fall out of that life in, in terms of when you actually die. You talked about them making things like axes and stuff. What can you tell about their behaviour from the evidence you have? Is it comparable to ours? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, well, if we're talking about modern humans, I mean, they are essentially us, but earlier versions of it. What you see is you know, the, the thing that makes us special is the fact that we aren't easily categorized and, and put in a box. We do lots of different things. We're incredibly flexible and very versatile with what we do. So when you look at the sort of stone technologies of the period when we are just emerging, uh, what you see in the stone technologies is a standardized way of making things that then can be applied to any situation. So they're, they're organizing themselves so that the stone tools can be used, you know, if you want to butcher an animal, you've got sharp knives, you can get on and do that. But equally, you can use the same sorts of technology to process plants. And you can also apply hunting technology to different sized game and so on. So it's flexibility that's the key to it. But you know, points and scrapers and blades and so on, they all are being made. It used to be, so I'm sorry if I'm talking too fast, but I'm telling you to slow down if I'm, I'm too fast. No, no, it's great. We're both really excited. <laughs> Okay, well, that's good. Um, it's, it used to be thought, you know, modern humans were all about making blades, but you know, blades come in in different places at different times and are used by different species. See, so Time Team has done that to people, hasn't it? Because every time they do prehistory, they're looking for a pointy bit of rock. <laughs> Harsh, but probably true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, well, the, the thing is, we, as archaeologists, we need to be able to sort of categorise materials. We need a language, the basic language, to define our tools and things so we can know what we're talking about. But the danger is then the meaning we put on top of that. So, you know, hand axes, homo erectus, scrapers, Neanderthals, blades, modern humans. It worked for a while, you know, it worked for a while, but now we can look, you know, worldwide at sort of the nature of variability and it, it doesn't work anymore. There's a trend towards much more uh, blade use and so on with modern humans. 
and microlithic use and so on too. But you know, it's it's never simple. You always need to look at the context in which the evidence is, is, is being brought up. My next question is going to be. So I love this. Um, so I'm really fascinated, um, and as and Linda as well. I know Linda, you're listening with um, religion and burial methods. I mean, do we know if they practice anything of the sort? Wow, right. That's that's very timely because um, the team I work with just published a paper uh, this a couple of months ago now on prehistoric burial, particularly looking at Neanderthals. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and I know I don't want to spend too much time on the Indus House because I know you've already covered them, but we would been working at the site of Shanidar in Iraq and we discovered another, well it may be another Neanderthal, it may be one that was already partly found before. And at that site they claimed they were buried with flowers. You know, and the house came along and they, they buried a series of individuals in exactly the same spot, within two meters, you know, exactly the same spot in a cave that's you know, a thousand square meters in area, they come to the, exactly the same spot and burying individuals at different times. So there's obviously something means a lot to them to be coming there and burying their, their but in, interring, bury, you know, sometimes we need to be careful about the language you use, that you know, the bodies are being disposed of in the ground, as it were, you know, it just scoops out and then they're being buried, you know, earth being thrown over the top. There's an argument about whether they were buried with flowers based on the pollen. And the jury on that one is is still out. Although I'm, I tend to believe that, in fact, first of all, I, when I went to work at the site, I thought, no, yeah, it can't be true. You know, flower burials and so on. Um, increasingly, the evidence to me looks like perhaps they actually were burying Neanderthals with flowers. So again, what does that mean? Um, we don't know. But we have a lot of relatively a lot of Neanderthal fossils compared to their contemporary modern humans. So when we think about, did modern humans bury their dead? We, I mean, we certainly do. And if we trace that further and further back, you think about the Neolithic, you get ritual monuments where some people are being buried. And that's the other thing, of course, it's not everybody who's being buried, it's just some people. So, you know, what's the significance of that? Are you looking at, you know, key individuals, important figures? Are you looking at hierarchy? All these sorts of things could be considered. But Neanderthals seem to be burying their dead in a way that's more visible in the archaeological record than modern humans are at the same time. So there's lots of questions that link to that. You know, what does that mean about religious beliefs, their int int intelligence, their sort of, do they have belief in the afterlife? Are they just getting rid of something that's going to get very smelly and attract a lot of predators? You know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> All of these things are, are something that, you know, we need to um, take into account. But it does look like the endotiles are doing things that, if it was us, we would say were pretty clever. That's brilliant. I just, I love the nuances of it. It's great. Um, talk about eating. Do you, so we <laughs> talked to Matt about what Neanderthals were eating and that is, is it the same or it, if you, what evidence have you got about it? I mean, Alina's put, how did they eat? I'm like, well, they put it in their mouth, Alina, but I, I'm sure she <laughs> meant something else by that question when she wrote it. But yeah. So, so what do we know about um, them eating? Right, well, it, again, one of the, the old cliches used to be that modern humans were smarter and cleverer and could eat a whole a wide range of species that the Neanderthals were not able to collect. But equally, that modern humans could also be very specialist and focus down on particular species and hit them particularly hard when they're in season. So salmon runs or reindeer when they're migrating and so on. Now, again, it's, it's difficult. The record is always biased against plant eating because of course you know the plants don't preserve very well but they seem to be eating the, you know, the same ranges of species but modern humans hit coastal resources you know shellfish um soon sooner than, than, than you know, before neanderthals seem to be doing it uh, the evidence from neanderthals is a bit equivocal um fish uh, birds rabbits you know small small furry fluffy things you know they're eating a whole range of things uh tortoises you know they're, they're, they're the 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 snack in a pack you know you basically just turn one upside down it can't go away you can come back and stick it on the fire whenever you feel like it so <laughs> you know <laughs> I, I can't get over that image in my mind <laughs> i'm sorry about that <laughs> So they can eat, you know, a whole range of different, you know, animal species and the technologies for that. They, they seem to be using things like traps. 
at one site I worked at in Borneo, uh, they seem to be eating things like catfish, which live in the bottom of, of muddy streams, but they don't seem to have sort of the nets and things to catch them. What, you know, how are they getting them? This is the big question. Well, we found these big, big pits with starch grains in them from plants which are poisonous, even taro, things like these ground storage root um, vegetables, which you have to soak and dry, soak and dry, pound, and then they make flour and then you can eat them. But that produces a lot of toxins in water. So if you took that water and then throw it into the river, basically the, the, the catfish are poisoned, they could just float up to the surface and you've got you know, fish from, from that means as well. So we think they may actually be doing that you know, 40 or thousand years ago in, in Borneo. That's really so it's a, smart. It's, yeah, it's incredibly smart. I mean, it's one of the things I always you, you ponder. Who was the first person who discovered that you can eat this thing, but only if you pound it and soak it and pound it and soak it? I mean, what... Someone what, who what, didn't like their mother-in-law and was desperate. <laughs> and how important <laughs> would it be, you know? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a really tangential question and just go off on one? No. <laughs> No, I want to. Cannibalism. So obviously, oh, like, oh. Mod, to us now, it just it's unacceptable to eat your own species. But what about back then? Is there any evidence of it? I don't know why this interests me, but it does. I mean, is it because it's just a survival thing, isn't it? If the Do meat you want is to dead, eat me? Or... Is this what it is? You're planning on eating <laughs> me or something? Possibly. I'm just trying to think how I'd cook you now, but that's really go off, going off on a tangent. No, but I'm just interested, back then, do you see evidence of like a practicality in that perhaps there was meat available if someone died and they were fresh, so they ate it? I just, I'm interested. Well, the evidence from a couple of sites suggests that Neanderthals might have done. Um, the evidence from modern humans is more equivocal at the same sort of stage. Uh-huh. Um, the times in which they're living could have been actually, you know, with, with into harsh ice ages, long yeah. hot winters and so on. The amount of protein there might not be very much. So the idea of you know, Granny's looking right past it anyway, this, you know, she can spare a limb, might actually... But I'm just thinking of that. If somebody died, you can just then reprocess them. But yeah, I just, that's what I'm thinking. It's just like a practical sort of solution. If they're, I mean... Granny could feed you for a few days. I, I don't <laughs> oh my god, Alex, I'm I mean, sitting here laughing. I just want to know if it's something. The idea that we don't eat each other is something that's evolved over a long, long time. Is what I'm asking. I don't know why I've suddenly become really interested in this. But I, whether it's a very <laughs> modern concept or whether we can see evidence of it not being acceptable that long ago. It's it's one of those things that you know the ev- the argument is always always out on. You know, if if you want to sort of diss the neighbours, you always say, oh, they're cannibals. So a lot of the a lot of the historical accounts of cannibalism, when you investigate them, are actually basically people just dissing their next door neighbours. Oh, we've so had when, that on History Hack before. The first thing people accuse each other of is eating babies in yeah, all periods of history. That's right. Yeah, indeed. You know, mm. And when the, there were problems with um, in sort of the early postmodern period with sort of Ireland and England and, and battles, the Irish were dismissed as oh yeah they eat, eat you know they're cannibals and they're you know, it's, it's trying to create something that is is different and other and and, and nasty and, and horrible, so it's just one of those things you throw at people, but at the same time cannibalism, if it's a way of processing war dead or, or capturing the powers of individuals or just humiliating individuals. Um, is something that modern humans have practiced. How far back that goes, we just don't know. Thank you for indulging that. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, <laughs> it just suddenly <laughs> occurred to me, and I was really interested. Too. You know, if you if you want to look outside our species, you know, chimpanzees have been known to do it too. Oh, really? Yeah, they actually hunt and kill, um, usually younger males, on of other uh, other um, chimpanzee packs. Not oh, that's like two birds with one stone, isn't it? Taking out like potentially future dominant males in opposing groups and yeah. getting dinner at the same time oh my yeah. god <laughs> no it's interesting so gorillas is like is um, my numbers i haven't this was six months ago but gorillas are like 98 percent the same but what are we like 95 <coughs> percent the same as chimpanzees it's it's it, gorillas are less close than the chimpanzees are oh too. so it's the other way around yeah that's okay right. but um, to be honest <laughs> we can get a bit over enthusiastic with the with the, the biochemistry as it were so you know there are people who say that we are actually so close to the chimps that we should be called chimps well i think those are guys who just don't get out enough you know too yeah, much time in the lab. 
that's like I need to write an article for a journal and I need to say something epic I'm gonna go with this is that right <laughs> have I just made an enemy of all the uh, chimp loving archaeologists anthropologists oh, yeah. anthropologists that's the ones oh, um, oh, no. <laughs> right okay let's get back onto Alina's questions because they are really good and I've just waffled on about something <laughs> since now Alina would like to know about living space is there archaeological evidence for where they live are they nomadic do they move around or do we see homes Ha, ah, home is where the heart is, and we don't know what they thought. Um, it's, there are sites where people are clearly living longish periods. Um, it's been argued that Neanderthals tended to move as a group en masse around the landscape and exploit animals as they go and plants as they go, whereas modern humans tended to be more organised. They would place groups in areas where resources are, are, are good and local, and then send out, send out work parties to actually you know, do a bit of hunting, bring stuff back and provision the ideas. The idea of it's like a home base, you know, where everyone can be and you send out work parties and so on. So modern humans' sites tend to be, they tend to be more of them. Um, they tend to be larger, more diverse in terms of their contents and, and what they, they, they construct. There seem to be some evidence for, for structures, um, but you know, not substantial housing, but you know, tents and, and so on and different organisation of the tasks in different places. So there'd be napping areas, half areas, sleeping areas, and so on. But you know, they, they define their space by what they do around them. I mean, one of the guys in the group we were talking about, burials, suggests that Neanderthals basically worked around them. So they, basically their, their living space was what was around them within reach and so on. Whereas modern humans tend to, to co cooperate more, sit around and work together more. So it's like a social, a social space, the sense of social space was different between Neanderthals and, and modern humans as well. It's a complex thing because, because modern humans, what are we talking about? Are we talking about these guys 330,000 years ago where we have virtually no evidence? Or are we talking about them 40,000, 30,000 years ago where we have increasing amounts of evidence? But they do seem to be much more organized technologically and things. They're moving materials across the landscape more. So they're moving a lot of raw materials, exotic raw materials and things like this around the landscape more too. So they're, they're logistically organised, they're out and about, but it's work parties. So different groups of people who then come back to the main group uh, seem to be the way they seem to be organised. Can I throw something in here? Yep. I'm gonna Sounds throw... worried now. He's like, is it going to be weirder <laughs> than the cannibal stuff? <laughs> no, no. I, I don't want to start a whole debate about it because I think it's a whole podcast in itself completely a podcast in itself but tim took us around um some old stuff when we were at uni <laughs> the technical term um i can't remember exactly where we went we went with to a place that had sticks in the ground and um <laughs> some sort of no don't, don't laugh at me well, really no, we've done this, this before and we usually come to the conclusion that you were at woodhenge that's the one woodhenge thank you Thank you. I forgot what it was called. Um, but I wanted to throw I wanted to throw in here um, a bit of Stonehenge because you just triggered my mind and saying, oh, they moved materials around. There we go. Stonehenge. If you want to hit us with one line, maybe two lines about it, because we'd love to come and do another podcast about Stonehenge in itself. Well, Stonehenge is obviously much, 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 much later um, and different economies oh, and so on. But the interesting thing about Stonehenge is it, it's been suggested that not only did they move the stones, the, the blue stones from, from Wales, but they actually all moved them in order of, that reflected the geology of the um, mountains they came from, the Priscilla Hills. So they're, they're different types of blue stone and they were actually transferred and, and ordered according to the geology of where they came from. So not only are they moving things vast distances, but they've, they know their stones, they know which stone is which and what order they should all be going in and then they recycle them so there's there's blue stone hens that's over you know, down towards the river which then gets recycled as they you know, rework and rebuild uh, one of the phases of stonehenge the later stages in put that stonehenge okay so in my mind again you're gonna laugh at me in my mind i've got this image of early humans either running around completely naked <laughs> or with some sort of loincloth wrapped around their Bits. parts um, <laughs> <laughs> do we know if they actually wore any clothing at all and is there any evidence of it ah good question there's evidence for weaving um and and 
and some textiles that dates back sort of up towards about 30,000 years ago. So the odds are they were, you know, they were certainly making using string and woven the things. It's a short step from making woven things like you know, nets and things to catch animals to, to tying things up to yourself and wrapping them around you. Um, the odds are they also were wearing skins and hides and so on. So I, I think it's they're almost certain. I don't know if you know if you, you fancy going sort of standing completely naked in the middle of winter in Britain. You know, these guys are living through ice ages where conditions were much, much harsher. It's not impossible. I mean, when um, they discovered the Tierra del Fuegans in the bottom of South America, they had horrendous, cold, wet, damp conditions and people were running around virtually naked there. So we have a great ability to adjust to conditions, but allowing for that, I, sus I suspect that actually they were wearing clothes. And in fact, we have a very bizarre line of evidence in terms of the DNA of body lice and hair lice, because um, you can see how they've evolved. Um, they've evolved hand in hand with our bodies and the fact that we cover them up so that they're protected and they can, you know, so they can speciate and things on the new conditions of people wearing clothes. It's a nice thought to end on. <laughs> <laughs> How are your lice, yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, arts. Do they practice uh, music maybe harder to discover than things like cave art? Or are they amusing themselves as well as just trying to survive <laughs> and not freeze to death? Uh, very much so. I mean, I think they actually had quite a, a rich social life. I mean, what else do you do in those yeah, dark ones? Better than us <laughs> now, anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, imagine what you know, we're sort of partitioned and under lockdown in very small groups they were pretty but we have you know, media to get out through they would be in large groups in 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 confined spaces for a long period of time over winter and so on you, what do you do to amuse the kids what do you do to sort of keep people happy and engaged and so on you, you you'd sing you perform and if you look at modern humans they have large hearts people they're centers their focal points you know for performance and, and so on so you can well imagine people sort of singing around the campfire you can imagine it but how do you find physical evidence for it and archaeologically of course you know we have large campfires but that's all we have we don't have you know any any of those things there are some things that have been claimed to be musical instruments you know bird bones with piercings through them so they could use them as, as flutes and so on uh, but again a lot of musical instruments are made from organic you know, uh, com composition materials, and so they waste away. But I would say it's almost certain that they were using musical instruments and things. And art, well, you know, art in various forms, however you interpret the record, could go back over 200,000 years in Southeast Asia. Um, Neanderthals, it now seems, were making art 67,000 years ago in Spain, painting caves and doing a, a sort of noughts and crosses board engraved in the cave at um, in, in, in Gibraltar. So Neanderthals were doing it. it Maybe we actually learned it from them, but we certainly were doing it too. But again, not everywhere. Not every, every society is doing all these things all at the same time. It's very easy to become sort of stereotyped. All modern humans were like this. But you know, people are variable, people are different, and cultures are emerging through these times and isolating and you know, defining themselves differently. Tim, you have done some just amazing excavations. Um, we all know this from being in your lectures. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, do go to Birkbeck if you want to study archaeology. Tim is a fantastic <laughs> lecturer. Um, and you've gone literally around the world doing your excavations. Can you tell us what is the most interesting thing you have ever found on an excavation? Ah, well, this is, this is if, if you like, this is my life cycle. When I was a, a teenager, uh, <laughs> it's a long time ago, Back in the 70s, there was a Scientific American came out about the Shanidar Neanderthals. You know, and that's one of the things that got me into archaeology in the first place. And now, amazingly, I am actually digging the Shanidar Neanderthals with, you know, with a great team. Uh, and so to excavate, the last two, three years, we've had the skull, mandible, shoulders, hat, one hand, uh, ribs and back of a Neanderthal. It's just the most awesome thing. It just really brings these people together. And... It's been a, a, you know, a lifelong interest. So for me, digging Shanidar is just like the best. <laughs> it doesn't get much better. Dreams come true, right? Eventually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've never dreamt it. That, that sort of 
you know, gawky teenage kid who you could see me, you know, you think, bloody hell, how's that? So, you know. You know. <laughs> What's the best thing that's come out of it so far? Well, have, actually having the physical remains of a Neanderthal. They yeah. are still incredibly rare. So to have, I mean, and also to have the iconic bit, you know, the skull and the jaw, the teeth, you know, the, the head of a human being is always a significant thing, you know, <laughs> think of a head cult and all the rest of it. So to have a Neanderthal skull there in the ground and seeing it painstakingly excavated and removed. And we had a, a, a brilliant um, you know, human bones person who lifted it, it took forever to do, you could serve it and treat it so you could lift it. And she did an amazing job. And, you know, to, to have that there, I mean, it's just fantastic. That's I could have the, seen the look on your face in my mind right now, you know, <laughs> finding it and then going, oh, my God, it's coming out of the ground. This is so exciting. Sorry. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, well, that, that's, you know, it, well, I wouldn't say we're all treasure hunters, are, but we all, you know, that joy, the excitement of discovering something and being the first person or one of the first people to engage with that after all these thousands of years. I mean, it is. That's the romance of archaeology still. It's still a fantastic thing to be doing. Real privilege. That's why Alex and I have to go and do some more because I haven't done any digging, gosh, in about three years now. So don't don't hold that against me. But I'm trying to convince Alex for us to go and do some really cool stuff. And we're trying to jump on, you know, and look at what people are digging and do our own little chime team, right, Alex? Boom. Pointy rocks all round. <laughs> <laughs> it's just my brother's one pet peeve of being made to sit through this on a Sunday evening back in the day was that he'd have to sit through it for an hour and they'd find nothing but a bit of flint and tell you that it had been worked into a pointy object of some description by someone a very long time ago and that he felt cheated at having spent an hour on it. But it says more about my brother than it does about archaeologists. Um, let's finish with, so we talked about what you have found. Mm. Is there something you would like to find that would answer a burning question that you have? What would be your dream find? <laughs> it probably doesn't exist, but a, a mixed cemetery with Neanderthal and modern human bodies buried together with organic preservation. I mean, <laughs> it's the ultimate fantasy, and it, you know, and the, grave goods and stuff. Yeah, the whole shebang <laughs> answers everything all in one. You know, we can all give them, retire then. You know. Is this something that's contentious? How much they intermingled with each other? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, they did interbreed, but on what terms, and you know, all those sorts of issues, and how frequently, and when, and where, and so on. Yeah, and the reconstructions, the recent recon, well, relatively recent reconstructions of the Endertal, uh, the Natural History Museum, for example, had them with tattoos. You know, oh wow! Answer, I just, but did they? So just answering those sorts of questions. What did they look like? We know that you know, some of them had red hair. You know, so. Bring up the humanity of it. What we have are dry stones and bones. It's our job to sort of put flesh on them. But it'd make our lives an awful lot easier if they came with flesh attached and we could actually say, well, okay, yeah, we're actually right. Or we're up, we're not right. You know? So, yeah, that would be fantastic to have all everything you ever wanted just sat there on one site. Hugely expensive. And you'd you know, how do you preserve all the dead bodies and stuff? But wow, what a good sort of thing to have. Who cares? We'll crowdfund it. <laughs> you Please find it we'll crowdfund it exactly come to us and we'll get it all sorted for you not a problem. i'll remember that it's, i'm pretty it's... sure everyone would work for free on that site if you found it anyway oh god yes oh god do you know what i'm i'm thinking about um how you said about this the cemetery or cemetery you know inverted commas um but how people could view us in hundreds and thousands of years now the way we live you know Oh, look, I just found this uh, sort of thing with uh, buttons on it, you know, telephone or, you know, what, what, what did we look like? It's, it's just really interesting looking back so far to think what are people going to look at us like in the future? Yeah, I, you know, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there was that joke about, you know, the shoe layer where the, all these people had, had shoes and built up and built up. Uh, who knows, to be honest? I suspect, you know, hundreds of thousands of years from now, uh, it, it's debatable whether or not we will be here. You know, um, we face many, many challenges at the moment. I think we're ingenious. I think a variation on the theme of us will be here. But whether they will do archaeology and whether they'll be interested in the past, they may actually look back at the past and think, "Thanks, guys, you really once you got us into this mess. Look at the, you know, look at the plastic layer. Look at the, you know, the you, lack of biodiversity. Look at the mess you made." <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's always good to have someone to blame. So. You know, who knows what um, people many, many years hence would, would, would say about us. But 
archaeologically, we've certainly left a huge, huge imprint on the on the planet. They'll find you, Tim, with uh, with your trowel and your paintbrush. <laughs> Surrounded <laughs> in plastic, yeah. <laughs> Tim, that was so awesome to have you back on and have you chatting to us about the modern human, talking to us about just the incredible amount of evidence because I didn't realise how much actual evidence there really was. I'm really sorry for being so ignorant. But it is just great. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. It was fun. Join us tomorrow when Nick Ramos returns to talk all about Cuban history. He covered it for us before and he went up to the 20th century. Now we're getting into the good stuff. We're getting into Castro. We're getting into the revolution. So don't miss that because once again, he's on fire. Don't forget, you can become a patron of History Hack for as little as a dollar a month. Just go to www.historyhack.podbean.com. It will help us keep going in the aftermath of the coronavirus and we would really appreciate it as we would love to do so.